Hello, nephew members, and welcome to today's nephew podcast. I'm Sachin Hazarnes with Otsuka Medical Affairs, and I'm joined to- today by Dr. Arlene Chapman, who is the Section Chief of Nephrology at the University of Chicago and the Director of the Clinical Research Center for the University of Chicago's Institute for Translational Medicine. Today, we'll be discussing the future of healthcare beyond 2020 with Dr. Chapman. Welcome, Dr. Chapman, to this podcast. And um, we would like to understand your current thoughts about the future of healthcare evolution beyond the next six to 12 months. And I would like to start this, um, this conversation with you by asking you, how has your practice changed over the past six months? Thank you, Sashin. Um, that's a very complicated question. Uh, my clinical care uh, involves both inpatient medicine and outpatient uh, ambulatory care. And my ambulatory care has changed quite a bit, moving away from in-person visits to virtual video visits for the most part. Uh, I'm in uh, the city of Chicago, um, and the current case rate for COVID-19 is under relatively good control. And so in the last month, my virtual visits have converted to in-person visits for the most part. Mm -hmm. I imagine that that aspect of my care may move back and forth depending on the activity of the virus and the case density in the city of Chicago. Uh, On the inpatient side, um, certainly for the months of February, March, April, May, and part of June, we segregated patients who were COVID positive into COVID units in the uh, hospital. Um, And we asynchronously rounded with our trainees. So rather than rounding together as a group, we would take turns going in to see the patient so that we reduced exposure as much as possible during that time. This also has changed because our caseload in the hospital has come down nicely um, and we have resumed all in-person rounding with our fellows, residents, and interns. Uh, Our patients are no longer in a COVID segregated unit. They're found throughout the hospital. And in part, that's because we now have enough PPE or protective equipment to be able to see the patients. What's gonna happen in the fall, the winter, or until we actually have a vaccine that works, which I'm guessing will be sometime in 2021, um, will probably be related to the density of the cases at our hospital. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so while you were using telemedicine, were you using any particular uh, apps like Doximi? Do you like those kind of interactions? Or moving forward, would you still prefer uh, an inpatient examination because uh, you might miss something that you cannot see on telehealth, you know, via telehealth. What what is your preferred, um, uh, you know, mode of seeing the patient? And also, how do you see adapting yourself if you were to really go all telemedicine? So I do not patient by telemedicine. I will know. I think that's too difficult to really understand everything about the patient. So if it's a new patient who's seeing me for the first time, they need to see me in person. Uh, Mm -hmm. Unless I'm forced to, I think that will continue for the unforeseeable future. I think for the patients that I know well and are stable uh, and we have a treatment plan in place, substituting in-person visits for video visits is certainly possible. I don't know if it's as good as in person, but it's possible. And I think we can provide care that's good enough for the patients. Um, I do think that Chicago has its own geographical barriers for in-person visits, forgetting pandemics and COVID-19. So many patients who come to see me can spend two hours one way coming to see me. So having virtual visits as a possibility is actually in some ways, a benefit to some of these patients. Um, Intermix, you know, in-person and virtual visits. But I I will not initiate care with the patient unless I can meet them in person. That's that's a great, that's a fair uh, thing, yeah. And what do you think will be the main driver for the future of healthcare in this current situation? 
Well, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I think we're all discovering that there's pros and cons to virtual visits. I think people's lives carry different levels of importance in terms of their health maintenance. I've seen uh, people motivated to take care of themselves more now. I've also seen people struggle to take care of themselves enough. So I think it's going to play out on an individual basis. I do think that healthcare has an opportunity to rethink how it pays for taking care of patients. I mm -hmm. think it really does. You know, you listen to a lot of the podcasts of different doctors going to virtual visits and what they find problematic with it. And, and some urology offices lose out on getting a urine sample to test. And so they see that as income lost. But quite mm. frankly, I bet that over 90% of those urine samples don't add any information to their decision making. So okay. I think there's a way to use this as an opportunity to uh, really streamline the cost of healthcare delivery. I think that's a that's a great uh, you know outlook that we might see you know in the future. So, what is the biggest concern that you have for the future of healthcare, given the the new normal and uh, the new things that we are slowly everyone is adapting to? So, I do think because no one knows enough about uh, COVID nineteen and its clinical outcomes and its manifestations that there's an awful lot of new information out there that hasn't been peer reviewed or validated. And I think the same thing goes with uh, patient outcomes who move to video versus telephone versus in-person visits. So one thing that I am worried about is that we need to make sure we look at data about how our patients are doing in these settings. I think there are a large number of patients who are too scared to come in and be seen. And mm -hmm. so important time lapses occur where they may not notice that something has changed with regard to their blood pressure or their weight or their hemoglobin A1C or their cardiac function. And so COVID not just causes illness itself, it causes secondary changes in other chronic medical conditions. Right, right, yeah. And uh, I guess that, you know, we have, as a community also over the past couple of months we have seen so many different guidelines that have been popped up uh, also how it affects the kidney uh, whether you know some medications make it worse make it better and uh, there's so much so much data that we are still still learning about the whole thing and during this time when there is so much information that is can be right can be wrong uh, what do you feel that nephew as a community how can we contribute to the nephrology community, you know, as a whole during these times? Uh, what can we do uh, to help this, you know, provide that information? Yeah, well, so from a public standpoint, I think that there is um, the opportunity to really take um, the leading voices about protecting oneself from contracting COVID. So that would be really following, you know, Dr. Fauci and the leaders at the CDC and, and making sure that those links are available to people through NEPHEW. From uh, a kidney standpoint, I do think there are research groups across the country that are gathering now to really understand better what COVID does to the kidney um, and what it means for someone who's either on dialysis or who has chronic kidney disease or polycystic kidney disease um, should they get COVID infections. Um, and I think those groups are all available on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so I would find out who the leaders are across the country. Mm -hmm. I, for example, I know Columbia University is very active in this area because they've had such a high caseload. Um, and there are other groups like that at other academic institutions. So I, I think keeping track of what um, those individuals with extremely large data sets who have an interest in the kidney are doing would be extremely helpful. Okay, yeah, and uh, I think that's what we are trying to gather information, um, you know, because we definitely want to help the greater community with with all, with all this information. Um, and how do you think we have potentially helped, you know, the nephew community? So I don't know how much nephew 
has a relationship with a dialysis unit around the country, but one of the hardest hit groups of patients and care providers are in the uh, outpatient dialysis units. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly high stress situation where patients interact with the community and have to come in three times a week to get their treatments. So they're a potential vector. Mm -hmm. They all come into this dialysis unit the PPE of the dialysis units is not the same as the ICUs in hospitals. They all use the same way scale. They all sit next to each other and they all have the stigmata of not wanting to share that they've been exposed to someone with COVID because they'll be sent right. to a different dialysis unit for two weeks. Right. So incredibly difficult time for dialysis providers. And it's very difficult for the staff, the medical doctors, the patients, the transportation individuals, everyone is so worried. And so one of the things I think is really important right now, while the caseload is very low, is to come up with strategies to help reduce that uh, exposure mm -hmm. risk and the stress. Okay, no, that's a great thing. And we also have some uh, resources on NEPHEW uh, which talk about COVID-19 and the kidneys and we are trying to touch some of the points that you just talked about, but I think, um we feel that we should add add a lot more information out there you know based on what you uh what you just said and um, i think lastly what i would like to ask you is how can we continue to improve awareness and patient outcomes during these times so the awareness i think i don't know how much you do videoing with uh, patients but i think that's a step towards helping patients have more awareness mm -hmm. of why it's so important to mask, why it's so important to share that they've had symptoms of COVID, why it's so important for them to share that they've been exposed to someone with COVID, um, so that everyone can keep everything as safe as possible. Um, for outcomes, um, assuming that someone uh, either has a chronic kidney disease that needs attention or has COVID and needs to be taken care of, I think people have been concerned about coming into medical centers. Um, they're scared to run into other people that have had exposures. And I think a lot of the data that's become available looking at risks for infection coming to medical centers suggests that people are actually safer in those environments mm -hmm. than they are in environments like grocery stores, things where people have to go and get things taken care right. of. Mm -hmm. I think people understanding that it's safe to go see the doctor and, you know, particularly if people have a number of medical issues that need to be addressed on a regular basis that they really should go to the doctor. I think that's a wonderful point that you bring up, you know, where really um, everyone is scared to go out and we are limiting our exposure to going out. I mean, even to the dentist or any other places. Uh, obviously, those are a little bit more high risk, but I think you bring an excellent point that seeing your doctor is much safer than uh, you know, going out and about and doing your other stuff. And it has long-term implications on your health. So um, I think this was um, really great, the insights that you brought to, to us. And uh, we really like, would like to thank you for your time and effort and your insights uh, for this podcast. And with that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. And oh, we you're hope welcome. To hear back from you soon. Thank okay. you. Okay. Take care.